Okay, so as I said, we're going to start now developing the theory of the ideal gas using the canonical partition function. So this is kind of a big topic which will take probably all of this week to get the final answer, maybe some of next week. This is the statistical mechanics. of the monatomic, so I assume there's only one atom per molecule, which means I ignore things like rotational energies or vibration energies, ideal gas. This is the topic, and as I said, it's quite complicated, so probably it will take a couple of lectures to get the results. So we've already worked out, just after the midterm exam, or at least I told you what are the energy levels of particles in a gas. Single particle energy levels. In a cubic box. The total volume big B. And we computed these and we found that they're labeled by a vector of integers, epsilon n. And the result was that the energy level is 2 pi squared h bar squared over m t to the minus 2 thirds n squared. Given by this, where n is a vector of integers, Three dimensions is nx, my, and z. Okay, and each of these is an integer. So this is, this result is actually only true for a cubic box where the sides are all the same length. But later on the results we derive will be true for any shape of box. We only need to make this assumption because it makes the energy level simpler. Later on we'll see it doesn't matter. The shape of the box does not affect the behavior of the gas, well, unless it's a very strange shape, but the volume does. So the volume of the box is important. Okay, so that's what we've got. Now, if these were non-interacting and distinguishable particles, then we can easily write down the partition function. If there were n non-interacting, distinguishable particles, then using the result we derived at the end of last time, I can write down the canonical partition function with sum over microstates e to the minus energy of microstates a, b, t and for non-interacting distinguishable particles you can split this into a sum over each particle by the energy levels that, like they will both vector n of e to the minus epsilon n over kvt raised to the power n. So if the particles were non-interacting and distinguishable, we can write down the partition function like that, and then we just calculate it and get the answers. But if you were to do that, you would get the wrong answer. 
And the reason it's wrong is because in a gas, the particles are not distinguishable. If I have a gas of helium, then any two helium atoms are exactly the same. I can't tell them apart. So in a gas, the particles are indistinguishable. So this means that this formula is wrong. In a gas, the particles are indistinguishable. Okay. Non-interacting is right. The ideal gas, the assumption is that they're non-interacting. But there's a particle. But as quantum particles, they are indistinguishable. You can't tell two of them apart. Now, this makes a big difference in terms of number of microstates. So this affects the number of microstates. Okay. Which means that we have to correct this equation to make it, to make it approximately true. So I think this is best illustrated by a couple of simple examples. And to make things simple, let's suppose I only have three particles. Okay, so I can specify the microstate by telling you what's the energy level of each particle. And let's suppose I have three particles. Let's suppose I have one particle here. Suppose I have one particle here, one particle here, and one particle here. Now, if these particles are indistinguishable, this is one microstate. This is one possible microstate. Indistinguishable particles is one microstate. So I'm going to shorten distinguishable, indistinguishable, just to stop my, save my arm writing so much. So for indistinguishable particles, this is one microstate because you can't tell them apart. But for distinguishable particles, you can think of these then as being balls which are numbered. In this case, there are many microstates. Because, for example, I could put the first one here, the second one there, and the third one there. But for distinguishable particles, the order matters. So I could also put the first one here, the third one there, and the second one there. Or, and, and, okay. So we've done this before in the section of combinatorics. I can do two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. So for the distinguishable particles, there's many microstates for one indistinguishable microstate. Okay. In particular, if there are three particles like this, then there are six possible microstates. One, two, three, four, five, six. So for distinguishable particles, there are six microstates. And all of these microstates correspond to the same microstate in the indistinguishable case. Here I can tell the particles apart, they have different numbers, but here they all look the same. So therefore the number of the microstates is different. And in particular in this case, if the particles all have different energy levels, then the connection is quite simple. We worked it out before. 
the relationship between this 1 and this 6 is that 6 is just equal to n factorial. We saw that n factorial is the number of ways of arranging n objects. So in this case, we have three objects, and we can arrange them in six different ways. In this case, it's quite a simple result. Okay. But the problem is that not all microstates look like this. I can have microstates where more than one particle occupies the same level. This is allowed for bosons and for distinguishable particles. So let's look at an example like that now. Okay. So if again I look at the case with three particles, but now let's suppose that there are two particles on the bottom energy level and one on the higher one. So now for the indistinguishable particles, it now matters whether the particles are bosons or fermions, because for fermions, this is not allowed. For fermions, you can only have one particle per energy level. So for fermions, let me do bosons first. For bosons, this is okay, so it counts as one microstate. And for fermions, this is no microstate. No microstates because you can't have two particles in the same energy level. Okay, and we can also look at the case for distinguishable particles. And again, there's more than one for distinguishable particles. So I can number them in different ways. I can have the first two on the bottom and the third one on the top. Or I can have, say, one and three on the bottom and the second one on the top. Or I could have two and three on the bottom and the first one on the top. So for distinguishable particles, this is three microstates. Okay, so the, the numbers of microstates is quite different depending upon whether the particles are distinguishable or not. And the relationship is quite complex. Okay, I get different answers for bosons and fermions, and I get different answers depending upon whether the particles are in the same level or in different levels. So the, the relationship between numbers of microstates is complex, and that affects the sum here, where you have to sum over numbers of microstates. So that's why this sum is only true for distinguishable particles, not true for a normal gas. So let me summarize that. The relationship is complex. complex relationship between the numbers of microstates or the distinguishable particles and the number of microstates for indistinguishable and in particular it's different for whether they're bosons or fermions. So we need to find a way of getting around this problem if we want to calculate the canonical partition function.
one way we can do so is the following. I said that if the particles are all in the same, oh, sorry, are all in different levels, something like this, then the relationship is quite easy. Okay? For every one microstate for indistinguishable particles, you get n factorial microstates for distinguishable particles. So if the particles are all in different energy levels, then the relationship is quite simple. So we can get the result as long as we assume that all of the particles have different energy levels. If all the particles are in different levels, <coughs> Then the relationship is simple. Namely, one indistinguishable particle microstate corresponds to n factorial distinguishable particle microstate. So in this case, we can make a simple relationship between the partition functions. For the indistinguishable case, we simply have to divide by n factorial. So therefore, in this case, and only in this case, z for indistinguishable particles is simply 1 over n factorial times z for the distinguishable particles. Because in this sum, you have n factorial microstates, and in this sum, you only have one. So you just divide by n factorial. So we can write down z for indistinguishable particles in the case that all particles are in different energy levels. But how do we know that this is true? How do we know that all of the particles are in different energy levels? Well, one way you can do it is to go to very high energies. If I go to very high energies, then the number of energy levels is very large, much larger than the number of particles. So in this case, I can be confident that all of the particles will be in different energy levels. So at high enough temperatures, You have that the number of accessible energy levels is much, much bigger than the number of particles okay. at some high temperature. Okay, and you actually have to calculate what this temperature is, but I won't do that for now. But at high enough temperatures, particles can occupy a very large range of energy states. Therefore, the number of energy levels will be much larger than the number of particles. And in this case, it's likely that there's only one particle per level. Just statistically, the number of levels is so huge that you're unlikely to put two particles in the same level. So I can draw a picture of this, right, to just illustrate. Suppose I've got four energy levels which are accessible, and suppose I've got five particles. Well, then you always have more than one particle in the same energy level, right? Four levels, five particles. In this case, you must put more than one particle in the same energy level. And if I go to the case where I've got, I go to slightly higher energy, so I can attain now, say, six energy levels, then it's possible that they all have different energy levels. Okay? It's possible that they can be like this. This is the case of six levels and five particles. 
but still it's fairly likely, statistically, that you'll get two particles in the same level. So in this case, sometimes they'll all be in different levels, but sometimes you will get two in the same level. Now if I go to a much, much higher limit where I've got millions of levels and just five particles, okay, so I can't actually draw a million levels, but you get the picture. If the number of levels is enormous, then it's highly, highly unlikely that these particles will be in the same level, just because there are so many levels to choose from. And as I increase temperature, I increase the average energy per particle, and I therefore increase the number of levels accessible. So as I've drawn it this way, increasing this way, increasing the number of levels, is increasing the temperature. So for high enough temperature, we can assume that the particles are all in different levels. And if the particles are all in different levels, then we can simply relate the partition function for indistinguishable particles to the partition function for distinguishable particles. So therefore, at high enough temperatures, we get that the indistinguishable partition function approximately 1 over n factorial times the distinguishable partition function. Okay. Right, so I think we better finish the class a bit early, okay? So let me just summarize what we've done so far. For distinguishable particles, this z is quite easy to calculate and we've written it down. And we've shown that at high enough temperatures, we can relate it to the real case, this indistinguishable particles, just by dividing by n factorial. So starting from Thursday's class, we'll start from here and we'll calculate this to find the properties of the ideal gas. Okay. One remaining point, which I will just finish by saying, is how high is T? How high does the temperature need to be? Well, in fact, it turns out not very high. This is a good result as long as your temperature is about bigger than one Kelvin. So apart from at very, very low temperatures, this result is a good approximation. And in particular, you know, temperatures on the Earth at room temperatures, this is an excellent approximation. So this is true. It's quite hard to show. Right? The question is, how high does the temperature need to be so that there are enough energy levels so the particles go all go into different energy levels? This is quite hard to prove, and actually I won't prove it this semester. But if you take the course next semester, then I will prove it then. So if you're going to take that course, you can see it then. Otherwise, you just have to believe me. Okay. Because this proof is quite difficult. Next semester, we'll develop some more theory, which will make it easier to calculate this number. So for now, just please believe me when I say that this is a good approximation, as long as your temperature is greater than about 1 Kelvin.